Welcome everyone all, everyone to another installment of the Chess and Education Committee's presentations uh, for professional development um, around different chess programs, different uh, activities related around chess and education. My name is John Galvin. I'm a scholastic chess coordinator in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm also the co-chair of the Chess and Education Committee uh, of the U.S. Chess uh, Federation, along with my uh, Co-Chair Renee Bartlett, we welcome you to our meeting, and we also have with us the Executive Director of, of U.S. Chess, Carol Meyer. Uh, in the last few months, we've presented a number of different programs and seen different examples of uh, chess programs, and tonight we're going to have yet another uh, outstanding um, program that we can all learn from. The goal of the Chess and Education Committee is to, to build a community of chess educators, and this is really the first year where we've really been uh, very active in terms of building this community. Um, so we, we're um, planning a number of different programs, including our monthly um, webinar, and uh, we hope that they've been positive so far. So tonight we'll be uh, learning about the uh, chess program at Hamilton um, School, which is located in Novato, California. It's a K-8 public school just north of San Francisco. And it's had a remarkable uh, success in terms of implementing a, a chess program that's reached lots of students in the school. Uh, over 70% um, of the students already know how to play chess and they've been taught to play chess with half that number being girls. So one of the, one of the areas we're really focusing on in chess and education is expanding the number of students who are playing chess and the number of girls. So there's a lot to learn from this uh, program in terms of the way they organize, the way they motivate children to stick with the program in creating chess as a fun and social activity with meaningful educational value. So I'm gonna introduce Abel Talamentes, who is the uh, program director at Hamilton Chess. Hi everyone. Uh, first and foremost, uh, my name is Abel Talamantes, the chess program director at Hamilton and member of the Chess and Education Committee. Um, it's exciting for us to talk about the Hamilton program uh, because sort of the approach we have at Hamilton and uh, some of the tools and strategies uh, that we use, we think would really benefit a lot of grassroots uh, programs and a lot of people looking to develop programs in their schools. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about how we got our program started and sort of where we're at now. Um, and not just the tools and techniques we use in class, but, uh, you know, how we take a more holistic approach to uh, how we teach chess and developing a growth mindset that the kids apply to other areas uh, uh, in school, such as athletics and, uh, as well as academics. Uh, so... Uh, to get this started, I'm going to introduce uh, Jay Ferguson, who is a uh, founding uh, board member at Rise Scholars, and uh, uh, he, along with Michelle Huff, uh, got the program started at Hamilton. So I'm going to pass it off to him. He's going to talk about uh, the inception of the program and how they got it to grow, and then I'll jump in later and talk about where we're at now. And uh, so, Jay, the floor is yours. Great, thank, thank you, Abel. Um, again, my name is Jay Ferguson and I'm a board member uh, with Rise Scholars. Uh, before we get to chess and nothing but chess, uh, I wanted to give you all some context for our program and why it's so important to us at Hamilton School and uh, Rise Scholars. First, Hamilton School. Um, as John mentioned, Hamilton's located in Novato, California. It's a TK through eight school of 550 to maybe 600 students. And that of course varies year to year. Uh, even though located in an affluent county, Marin County, Hamilton is a predominantly low to very low income community represented largely by new or recent arrivals distinguished by a majority Hispanic population where as Abel's finding out many kids and certainly families consider Spanish their first language. And unfortunately, Hamilton is also defined by very low academic achievement. And until now, a lot of apathy towards learning. It's a lot of bad news in there, <laughs> but that said, 
predominantly doesn't mean completely. Hamilton is a very diverse community. It's reflected in everything we do at the school and it's part of the reason why we like our chess program so much. You won't find many programs as diverse as ours. As for RISE Scholars, we're a 501c3 nonprofit serving Hamilton School exclusively. Our mission is to provide opportunity leading to personal growth and helping Hamilton students reach their full potential. And we do that in a variety of ways. You'll see some slides now that show some of our kids participating in RISE programs. Officially, RISE began in 2019, but we've been active at Hamilton for about eight years. Interestingly, eight to 10 years ago, Hamilton was a rough environment with a lot of behavioral issues, violence on campus, enough that I would say I wouldn't want volunteers coming back to that kind of campus. So Michelle Huff, our current board president, along with others, started a mentor program. Once a week, an adult mentor would meet for an hour with a Hamilton mentee. They would sit side by side with the child, kind of be another adult voice in their life, be positive, play games, listen to, the, listen to them, get to know them, and be in their corner. They weren't there to change a kid. They weren't there to be judgmental. And eventually, we had 130 mentors for 150 kids and a wait list. This was for troubled kids. It was for any kid. And this was the beginning to rise. This is how we started. And the campus calmed down. Everything settled out. So I was a mentor six years ago, and I saw kids at the end of school essentially just take off and be feral, what I call feral in the neighborhood. And that's when we realized, okay, we did mentoring. What else could we do to help Hamilton kids the most? And what we focused on was the opportunity gap. Many kids didn't or couldn't participate in normal opportunity. It could have been financial. It could be logistical. It could be you know, just plain getting to a sports uh, uh, activity. But either way, they weren't participating in normal activities, sports, music, theater, travel, coding, whatever it is, normal opportunity that kids in Marin had all along provide important lessons and growth outside of the classroom. And many Hamilton kids simply weren't part of that. The lessons they missed, teamwork, effort, achievement, resilience, grit, everything that could help them in their classroom, everything that would help them in life. So we asked ourselves, what could we do to provide opportunity? And this is where you could probably guess it, we focused on chess. Chess came to mind because my son, years before had played three, third through eighth grade chess at a school called St. Mark's. And the coach there, Ray Orwig, spent time with us and teaching us how we could start a program. It, it didn't tell it, he didn't tell us how to do the program, but as we walked away with arm loads of chess boards and pieces, we realized, oh, I think we could do this. So we immediately opened up a fifth grade classroom uh, for lunch, sent the kids to go there to get their lunch, set up the room as a chess room. They came back, ate lunch, played chess. When they left, we picked everything up and switched it back into a classroom. And for a, a semester, we, who didn't know any chess, learned just enough to teach them a little chess. But what we saw was a classroom full every single time we had chess, just one class, fifth grade. And that's when we realized, let's, uh, let's see if we can find a chess room. And there's a slide of our chess room right there. As soon as we opened a chess room, the kids realized, hey, that's ours. We, we, we are a chess school, we can do this. We expanded to fourth grade, we expanded to middle school, we expanded to third grade, we expanded to second grade. So that's kind of how that um, whole program kind of got going. It was based primarily on our interest to just provide opportunity to the kids. And what better place or, or way to learn about resilience, uh, grit, and the lessons of life, life than uh, chess. So what was next? Rise sort of said, hey, we still have the same problem in, in the summertime. The kids still don't have opportunity and they're losing knowledge in the summer. It's called the summer slide. Lots of kids in Marin would just amp up their activities. They do more and more and more. Hamilton, uh, Hamilton kids still had no opportunity in the summer. 
So we started an academic enrichment camp. We now have 125 kids every summer for five weeks, grades three through eight. 95% of our kids return each year. It's a long day with math, reading, STEM, robotics, art, chess, of course, lots of um, uh, crazy chess games, uh, athletics. We have inspiring college students. We have financial literacy for middle schoolers, keys to success. The whole thing gravitates around the concept of a growth mindset. So with that going, and a very successful summer program it is, we thought, what's next? Let's put in some athletics. Because we noticed that our kids, when they graduate from eighth grade, go to high school, and they aren't connecting with the high school community. They haven't participated in organized sports. They haven't been on a team. Many of them just simply haven't had the opportunity to play sports. Skilled as they are, they weren't playing sports. So we hired an athletic director, and now we offer soccer, basketball, volleyball, uh, track and field, cross country, uh, largely for our eighth graders and seventh graders so that they can participate, feel confident, be competent, not to be a star, but just to be on a team. It could be JV, could be freshmen. We don't really care. We just want them to participate, and it only helps in their high school career. And we've started early. So our littles, grades three, four, and five, are learning skills so that they'll be more adept and more competent themselves. Again, not to create stars, just to create participants. And then we said, what can we do next? With the early learner theme, our interventional tutoring in third grade and fourth grade takes readers who are learning to read, but behind grade level, who have to read to learn the next year, it brings them up to grade level so that they don't begin to fall back right away. And the same in math. Math, if you start to lose some important skills or you have holes in math, by fourth grade and fifth grade, you begin to think, I'm no good at math. It becomes a fixed mindset and you're dead in the water for math. So third and fourth grade, uh, for reading and math are big for us. All 40 of our learn to read readers last year reached grade level. And so far this year, the first year of our math, it looks like all 35 of our interventional math kids are gonna be at grade level in math. So the newest piece of uh, RISE Scholars for Hamilton School will be our Math Academy. And this is where we take any motivated math learner and execute what we call an advance. We want them to move ahead in math. We want them to be doing algebra in middle school, which for Hamilton right now is less than a handful of kids who are participating in an online algebra class. We want it to be a predominant uh, picture for the kids at Hamilton where most kids are doing algebra by middle school. With all that said, here's some takeaways I'd like to share with you. Uh, first of all, Starting a program, we learned kids are craving opportunity. They want to be challenged. They want to achieve. If the schools don't have the budget to provide for it, we'll step in and we'll do it for them. We also hope to change culture. Uh, changing culture just simply means instead of being apathetic to learning, we wanted active learners, people who love, who had a love for learning. Uh, and especially as it applied to academic achievement. It's been slow to happen. Academic achievement is by test scores is still pretty low, but we realize we've got something going. We have a whole group of kids we now call our kids. They play chess. Abel would know those are his kids. Those are our kids. They also play sports. They might be in interventional math and playing chess and playing volleyball. And this whole group is called Our Kids. They number, I hardly can guess, probably 200 kids out of the 550 kids on campus are now part of Our Kids. So in terms of changing culture, I think we're getting there. There'll be a tipping point when they're all our kids. And then lastly, if you're starting a program like a chess program or any of the other programs we've started, or even a nonprofit, just start. Just start at the beginning. Nothing we did was ever the whole picture when we got started. 
Chess was in a fifth grade classroom that went from classroom to lunch to class. Uh, our, our RISE Scholars program started with one mentoring program eight years ago. Uh, so my suggestion there is don't wait and don't try to be perfect, just start. And with all that, I'll go back to Abel. Abel uh, has done, I don't want to embarrass him, but he's done, an embarrass, he's done an amazing job as our chess director. And I think it's for three reasons. He likes kids, he likes to teach, and he loves chess. And fortunately, he's great at all three. So take it away, Abel. <laughs> Wow, it's, it's uh, uh, hard to go on after that kind of an introduction, but- <laughs> Don't mess but up. Th thank you, Jay, for kind of like sharing sort of the, the rise philosophy that sort of kind of like precipitated everything and got everything uh, going. Um, I came into the program, I took it over from uh, women's grandmaster, Carla Heredia, who sort of uh, started there uh, before COVID. Um, I actually introduced uh, her to Jay uh, when they were looking to uh, have a program director there first uh, when I was at the Mechanics Institute. Uh, but then uh, she went to Ecuador. Um, and so the opening was there. And I had visited the program before. And uh, one of the things that I really loved when I when I visited there, because um, I ran a tournament there uh, uh, for the Hamilton Chess, was they had their own dedicated space just for chess. So the room that you see there in the slide is, is the chess room. It's always the chess room. The boards are always out there. Um, it is like the chess player's room. And I, I think that's that's been really important uh, uh, for the kids to identify that they have their, their own space there. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that in terms of uh, just how that translates uh, to creating a greater connection uh, with uh, with the kids in this in with the program, but you know one of the things that I want to start off by saying is that we don't think that we have sort of the secret sauce of what uh, what it will take for every program to to succeed. Um, we're looking forward to sharing the ideas of what's worked for us. And we think a lot of the tools and the ideas can work to start other programs. And I'll be talking about some of those. Uh, but I think one of the important things is to have a lot of adaptability because you never know, you know, what kind of group and, and what they will take to and what they will like and, and really what brings them in. And I think we've been really good at, at adapting expectations, uh, because the most important thing for us is to get kids in the room and sort of getting them to just take that step forward to, to learn and experience and take some fun in learning chess and going that way. And uh, I think just being adaptable is, is one of the most important things uh, you could do to start a program. But primarily like the chess club at Hamilton, I think really represents like a safe space for the kids. Um, because uh, just the kids love going there to socialize. Um, so I'll start off by talking about our lunch program. And the picture that you see there is, is the lunch program. Kids pick up their lunch um, and they bring it to class and we let them eat inside. And uh, the, the lunch goes from about 11.40 a.m. to about 1.40 p.m. And it's a staggered, so the different grades get out at different times. Uh, so when we're there, we'll have, you know, middle schoolers, and then we'll see, you know, on some days, you know, second and third graders, and then on other days, uh, you know, we'll have the, the fourth and fifth. So, so we see them there uh, throughout. And it, the lunchtime class is primarily social. They'll come they'll actually, they'll eat their lunch. They'll play a game of chess. Sometimes they do blitz. Sometimes they do bug house. Sometimes they're just playing a regular game and they, they socialize. They're talking about uh, the schoolwork. They're talking about athletics. They're talking about chess. And uh, it, it's really great to see that, that vibe that sort of using chess and coming to the room and, uh, and then we're walking around and, you know, we'll see those kids and, and we'll challenge them, right? So, and we'll try to teach different kids a new thing. 
and every now and then, you know, we'll do like, you know, simple puzzles and challenge the kids to like solve it, you know, and sometimes we'll throw in some rewards, like uh, whether it be an Oreo cookie or, you know, uh, sometimes it's a popsicle or, or something like that. Um, but uh, the kids love experiencing that challenge and, and learning something new. And, and uh, so, so that that's fun. And like I said, it's not really a, an academic environment in terms of, of the lunchtime. Uh, we're primarily trying to like foster that joy and that curiosity and that, that love of learning, uh, but to also make them feel like welcome, that like they want to come and be a part of it. And uh, so that's what we do with our lunchtime program. It's like, you know, we're just trying to kind of rope them in and, you know, show them the chess is really cool. Um, but since we have our after school program, like the goal is not to like do like a full on lesson because there's really not enough time to do that in, in a lunchtime setting, but to, to show them that it could be fun, teach them the moves, show them little things and then, and then go from there. So that happens uh, three times a week there on, on campus uh, during lunch. And then we have on the, those same three days, which is Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, uh, we have our after school class. So our after school class, um, and this is more of our uh, uh, lunchtime. Sometimes we take the lunchtime program outside to the tables. So that, that's a lot of fun and kids love playing outside. But this is sort of our lunchtime class, uh, what you see here. And with our, I mean, sorry, our after school class. And in our after school class, uh, you know, we go a little bit deeper. It's more structured learning. Uh, we teach them about tournaments and tournament etiquette, uh, playing with a clock, notating. Uh, even the games that we have in class, we have them notate and go over games after. And we're building that more you know, having them learn how to play competitive chess. But even as we do all these things and take a more structured approach and, and are competitive and play tournaments, uh, we always emphasize uh, not the result of the winning and losing, but that it's important for them to always strive to do their best. So uh, always we say, you know, the winning and losing doesn't matter. Uh, the most important thing is uh, learning something new. And if you lose, let's go over the game and find out what you did wrong or, you know, keep practicing. Um, and it, it's fun to see these kids, a lot of them that started with coming in for lunch and then just learning how the pieces move and then progressing and developing. And what's, what's really fun about the group of kids in, in the after school is that they, they rise up to the challenges of uh, of the learning. So uh, for example, you see in this slide, uh, every Thursday we have a puzzle solving competition uh, where when I initially did it, we were doing, uh, you know, checkmate in one or find a fork, right? And now we've progressed to uh, solving mate in two and mate in three. And, and we, we allow them to work in teams uh, because, you know, well, although you know, if we made it individual, you know, it, the interaction that we've seen in class when they work together in teams is actually like a really cool dynamic. So here they are, they're trying to solve a puzzle. And, and when something gets really complicated, like a, a, a tough mate and two, mate and three, they build it on the board and they work together and they talk it out. And it's, it's actually like a really fun dynamic because it feel it, it builds sort of that team element where, where you know, people work together. Uh, to solve a problem. Um, so that that has been really cool. And uh, uh, so this class is two hours um, after school. Well, it's usually like 2.50 to 5 p.m. And uh, what's great about it is I, I remember when I was first a, a last year, I think we went 2.50 to 4.30. Um, and it was never enough time because these kids, you know, wouldn't stop playing. Uh, there was so much we wanted to do that we actually extended it to 5 p.m., uh, added another half hour to the program, and it still feels like not enough time because, like, kids are still playing past five. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of fun. Like, they, they love doing uh, the activities in class and working together. And, of course, you know, I, I usually leave, like, the last 10 minutes of class to let them do, like, you know, Blitz and Bug House to really get that energy out because they've worked so hard, you know, the two hours before. Um, so the after school program, you know, really teach sort of like the, the competitive play. 
The other thing that we really, that's really important for us as a program is to really develop a sense of culture and a connection with the community. So uh, the Nevada Unified School District, as you see here, you know, they, they kind of honored us for, you know, going to compete at state championship. Uh, and it was, it was great for the kids and some of the parents to, you know, to go to the school district and, you know, get, get, a, get a mention uh, for like, you know, their hard work and, and what they did. Uh, but one of the, uh, and we had one of our players actually uh, play one of the uh, board members on the school district uh, in, in, a bull, in a game of bullet while we were doing a presentation and uh, you know, she destroyed that board member, which was really great <laughs> to see. But, uh, you know, but it, it was really fun to see like our players, uh, you know, be recognized publicly for like, you know, the work they do. So that was really fun. That's Sherilyn. Uh, one, of the one of the tools that we use to sort of like encourage kids to kind of like work to develop is we we have what we call the our pilot license and our fighter pilot license. So for the kids that are new to chess, they work towards the the what we call the pilot license, and it's sort of they have to meet seven goals uh, in terms of learning chess. So it, it'll be uh, learning the moves of the pieces, how to set up a board. Um, uh, opening principles and control, understanding what control the center is and, and what checkmate is. Um, and then demonstrate, you know, play a full game out. And, uh, and then once they do all these seven steps, like they'll earn uh, the pilot license, uh, which is a medal. And, you know, they love working towards that medal and they'll want to say, hey, and, and we put stickers on right? Each time they meet one of the goals. So they'll be a hey, coach able, you know, uh, what do I do to get the fourth sticker? What do I have to do to get the fifth sticker? Right. And uh, it, it's kind of like a, a fun, cool incentive uh, a program in terms of getting the kids to kind of like want to learn to the next level. And then we have the fighter pilots license, right? For uh, kind of the more advanced kids, which, you know, incorporates, you know, the having a chess kid rating of, of, uh, of a certain amount and, you know, more advanced things. So this is like one of the cool techniques to have like sort of a, a goal system where the kids know what they need to do to meet that goal. And then they work uh, with us to try to like earn that sticker. And, and then when they get that medal, it's something that they earned. And uh, so that's been kind of a really good tool uh, for us to use. Um, in terms of like developing uh, a sense of like culture, I, I think you see this here. So this is an example where uh, we brought our lunch program outside to the lunch tables. And literally like we, we put chess boards like on every single table there was at the lunch and like kids sit down and play. You know, that, that's this is how many people know how to play chess like in the school. So, you know, here's an example. And just, just seeing this, it's, it's like you can tell that, you know, school-wide, there's a whole culture of chess players. Like, this, this is what you do at Hamilton. This is like one of the cool things to do, right? And uh, it's nice when we can do it outside. Certainly, we haven't been able to do it in the last month and a half with the with the weather we've had here, but um, but it, it's great to showcase to the school just like you know who we are and what we do through something fun like this. We do an, an outdoor activity, but again, it's it's really to kind of like sh showcase you know our our culture and community of chess players. Um, you see here where in the classroom, and I talked about this earlier, where uh, we really encourage kids to like work together on things. Um, uh, it usually translates through puzzle solving, uh, where uh, groups of kids, they'll form clusters and they'll work to solve problems together. And it's just really great to see the kids uh, rather than in most individual sports where, you know, people are learning on their own and are sort of invested in, uh, you know, solving something on their own for the individual idealized, you know, I did this, I solved it. They actually enjoy working together and, and doing it as a team. And uh, uh, really think that really bodes well for sort of the culture that in the classroom, because it's not overly individualistic. And, you know, there's these kind of like pods of people working together to, to solve problems. So that, that's really fun to see. Uh, one of the things we've also done is we branded some of our clocks and boards, like with Hamilton. It, 
we feel like it really gives that sense like, okay, this is Hamilton, this is the Hamilton club, the Hamilton chess club. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of our boards have the Hamilton logo and, you know, we have our clocks. It's kind of like it's Hamilton's chess club. We got your, we got our own clocks, we got our own boards. It's really cool. Uh, one of the things I love about our chess club room is we've actually started building a history that we've been putting on our walls. So we have a lot of the pictures from, you know, tournaments we've gone to and things we've done uh, up on the walls. And it's just going to keep growing year to year. So it's a lot of fun because you see the kids come in and then they'll look for themselves, right? They see, hey, look, that here I am when we went to this tournament or oh, when I was playing lunch, hey, I'm right here, I'm right there. And it's sort of important to us to sort of like create that history of, of players because I, I think it's important. I think it really helps to sort of like create that th this is ours, like this is our club, like, you know, this is like for us to be here. And I think when you create that atmosphere, like you make it so that kids feel more invested in the club's preservation and being a part of it and wanting to come to it because like they're there, a piece of them is there. So, uh, so it's really cool that we started to do that. Now, this picture is, is like super cool. And this is another thing that I think helps to grow clubs. It's sort of sideways. So you have to like think of it <laughs> flipped over the other way, but uh, on a wall in the chess club, it's, it's basically like a big chalkboard. And even kids that like aren't chess players per se, they'll come in because they just want to hang out and be around it. And then we said, okay, well, if, um, if you want to support the club, why, why don't you go and draw something related to chess or make a quote or, you know, just something positive related to chess. And over the course of the year, they basically, everyone's filled up that wall with like, you know, uh, you know, so-and-so was here, chess is live, you know, uh, uh, I'd say draw me a rook, you know, a draw a chess piece, you know, put a positive image. So like they've contributed their art to the, to the chess room. And uh, one of the things Jay and I talked about doing is that, all right, you know, we're going to take a picture of it, like we'll frame it. And then the next year we're going to have a brand new board where, you know, people can contribute new things to it. Um, in addition to this, uh, we've done occasional Twitch streaming uh, of like an online event. So all the kids have Chess Kid accounts uh, because we we saw that Chess Kid would be a way for uh, kids to continue their learning at home and practice. Um, and uh, we've told people that are like non-chess players, but but like coming into the room and being around it, they play, but they're, they're not so much like chess players. They want to take it to the next level. We said, Hey, hey do you want to help out like with the broadcast or do you want to help out, you know, with, you know, like some marketing stuff. So we're always looking to find ways to engage kids to be part of the club that may not be strictly like, you know, players that want to develop. And uh, you know, it, it if you think of it just like, you know, a kid would think about yearbook or any other activity, it's, it's sort of contributing to the school and this way they would be contributing to the club. So, so that's sort of another way that, you know, we really try to engage uh, kids, uh, you know, contribute their talents. I mean, uh, by my desk, I have walls of, you know, people that have drawn pictures, like they'll say, oh, you know, you know, what can I do? It's like, hey, why, don't you, why don't you draw me a picture? Uh, let, okay, use a rook, draw me a rook, but then uh, make something fun with it. And then they'll draw a picture and I'll, I'll put it up, right? So uh, it's, it, you know, people can be part of a chess club, even in like a non-traditional way. Um, so I think I'll, I'll conclude here before we do the Q&A is that structured learning is important especially when you do a, like a, a after school where you're trying to engage uh, like scholastic, you know, uh, tournament play and whatnot. And another thing that, that I'll add is, you know, we've organized scholastic tournaments uh, at Hamilton. So even though we've traveled to tournaments and done tournaments around the Bay Area, um, we've organized uh, scholastic tournaments in the school and they've engaged the community around us. So we've had kids in the community uh, looking for, you know, rated chess, and we've done, you know, a few rated tournaments and whatnot. Um, so, uh, 
So that that's been important. But I'll I'll sort of leave by saying that, you know, I think when as long as you foster that growth mindset, that the do your best. Um, and you try to create a culture within the, the school of players. Um, I think that's really important for long-term sustainability, uh, at least for us, um, because what's important for us overall is, is sort of the mentorship part uh, regarding the chess player. Um, so uh, we're rooting for the chess player that attends our chess programs as much in our chess program, we're rooting for them in athletics also. We're rooting for them in their academics also. And we sort of integrate everything together. Um, and I think that approach has really worked well because at the end of the day, like, you know, we often like to say that the lessons you learn in, in chess, you know, you know, apply it to other areas of your life outside of the classroom. And I think at Hamilton K-8, we really, do that in its whole because the kids that do chess also do the athletics and uh, they're also in academic you know, intervention programs and, and other things like that. And, and we're rooting for them and supporting them in all those other programs all the way. And we have good communication between, you know, like the athletic programs and us. So, um, you know, I think it's child focus, uh, child success focus first. I think that's what really keeps the kids engaged and, uh, feel supported in, in, in partaking in our programs. Uh, so that's what I have to say. Uh, I'm looking forward to any questions that might be available uh, and we're ready to go. Thanks, Abel and, and Jay. Uh, it's really an amazing program that I, I knew nothing about the program really before tonight other than a little bit. And I, you know, I had my own ideas of what, a, what, what your school looked like and it, it didn't match at all what was in reality. And it's really, um, you, I think you're both to be commended for the, you know, the work you're doing with the kids who probably need it the most. Uh, the, the kids you're serving are kids who um, need support of adults and great programs. And I think you guys are both doing like, you know, the best work possible, you know, and um, we do have some questions from, from our, from our, um, audience and I'll, I'll read some of them out and, and throw some in myself and have a discussion here between the three of us. Um, one, case, one question came from Amy, Amy, and it was, do students come to every, come every day after school, the same kids come all three days or can the kids come one day or, or do they go to another program on another day? What kind of commitment do the kids make when they come to the after school program? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question. Uh, prior to this year, it was pretty consistent. It's, it was the same kids. Uh, um, well, for the after school every day for the lunch program, it was, it's pretty much been most of the kids, although there'll be some differences. And, you know, Jay can probably talk more about like, kind of what he's seen, like historically. Uh, but in, but now this year, now that we've incorporated an athletic program, now it's like, you know, where I would normally have kids all three days. Now I'll have them two of the three days, but like the athletic director will contact me and say, Hey, let me show you the roster for volleyball. What do you think? And if there's a lot of chess kids there, I'll say, all right, chess is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. A lot of the chess kids want to also do volleyball. Can we do it Wednesday, Friday <laughs> or something that where the kids can also participate in chess? Uh, um, as well. And we've done really well in working together to, because, you know, we'd love to see the kids at least uh, two of the three days in chess. And uh, we've managed to do it where there's been little interruption of that. Um, but, you know, it's also success because these kids are trying different things and they're kind of like expanding their kind of their skill base and, and you know. So there's all a couple of questions about like how the after school program uh, runs. Um, it seems like you have a lot of students in the after school program. Uh, what is like the ratio? Do you have do you have like assistants with you or or high school kids or how how do you reach all the kids or or are you just is it just you? Well, it's me until recently. Uh, we have a volunteer now that uh, uh, the volunteer who himself previously had been part of the Rise uh, program uh, before. Um, and he's been helpful because he works with you know the more beginner kids. Um, but even in the after school program, which previously was for fourth through eighth grade, 
Uh, we've opened it up because we've seen some kids, you know, second and third grade that showed a lot of interest and curiosity and they've, they've started to learn a lot faster um, that we've let them in. And, you know, we've, we've let the parents know that hey, we're, we're fine letting them in and, you know, we're going to try to incorporate and work with them as, as best we can. Um, we've and, seen a uh, lot of schools, uh, school programs um, uh, organized differently. So are, are you, do you work for directly for k uh Hamilton, the Hamilton school, or are you, working for the sort of after school provider, the, the, the CBO um, in this case? Yeah, I work for Rice Scholars. And the Rice Scholars has a partnership with uh, uh, Hamilton K-8 school, but Jay can probably talk more about that. Yeah, they, they, I de we definitely are Rice Scholars and provide all this extra opportunity that the school does not have. Uh, we happen to use an outside administrator who, is the official employer and we have an agreement with them. So we don't need an HR department. We don't need a payroll department, um, but, but uh, ABLE reports directly RISE Scholars. RISE Scholars has made sure that we are hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder with the school. There's no conflicts and um, everything we do is always fully communicated and it's uh, been working really well. That sounds great. And, and is the program um, that the, the, for example, the chess program for schools, is it, is it free? Um, are there, are, I mean, how do you deal with, uh, are there any costs associated with any of, any of these programs? Yeah. Well, for the chess program, there's no cost at all. I don't think there's any cost for any of the programs. To, to the participants. There are costs. To the participants. <laughs> yeah. Right. There, there are no charges. Everything is, uh, is handled by RISE scholars. Um, and uh, you know we we will accept everybody. It, there's uh, it's it's just something that we want to provide for the for the community as a whole. So even when we organize tournaments and you know entry fees, rise pays uh, for all of that for the kids uh, at Hamilton. And in terms of, of parents, um, how how are the how do you communicate with parents, uh, in particular if you have you know. Um, English language learners. Um, how do you expose <coughs> parents to the benefits of, of being in this program, um, well, especially if they don't really know anything about chess? Well, one of, one of the interesting things about our after school program, but it is actually true even in lunch, is that probably half of the people in the class are probably more comfortable with Spanish than they are English. And sort of like half the class is communicated in Spanish. Uh, and, you know, what I do is I'll repeat any question in English. Um, and we, it, it's worked really well because I think, you know, uh, everyone is friends. They all know each other there in the program. Um, and then me sort of communicating everything back in English and answering in English, just, there's no there's nothing lost in the communication. Uh, so we send emails uh, in both languages. Our flyers are in both languages. Um, and actually, one of the more effective <laughs> means of communication is, is, you know, I, I have the texts, uh, the phone numbers of, of all the parents that are in our after school program. And I'll just text if there's like something to communicate, but primarily email, but if something that's more urgent or I need info, I'll just text and then they text back. They respond pretty quick and I'm texting in Spanish sometimes. And so that's kind of one of the benefits of just being like dual language also is that you know, I can that's communicate that's a little more. From the audience is something we were talking about right before the meeting started with is how do kids choose between uh, athletics and, 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 and sports um, do you find yourself sometimes losing your best players or the most committed players? Or how do you retain the kids in the chess program? You mentioned you had a very high retention rate. Um, do you feel that pull, especially as the kids get to like middle school, um, that, that uh, how, do you, how do you keep them uh, in, the, in the program? Well, I, I think uh, the best way to say it, and I, I say this jokingly, but it's a little bit true. Like it, it's almost like a rigged game because I'll, I'll, me and the athletic director, before the schedule of what days something is offered, uh, we'll get together and say, all right, it's going to be better for the chess program if we can have uh, basketball 
uh, for the fourth and fifth graders on these days, uh, because then it maximizes certain players being able to participate, right, uh, with, with us. So we haven't had yet where there's been like one uh, program that's really siphoning like all our players uh, from my perspective, thankfully. Uh, but we're also working to try to reduce that from happening by communicating with the athletic director. And, and I'll know which players are wanting to participate in what athletics. And then, then we work together to make our schedules so that it's the least impactful, you know, for, for both sides. And I, I, I would like to add, uh, John, that we, we, we want the kids to be doing more than one thing. So it's really just incumbent on the coaches to talk to the kids about communication. Just let them know what you're, you know, what's on the schedule, what's coming up. If it's an important soccer game or it's a really important chess match, just figure it out. You know, communicate with your coaches. And uh, I, that's what's going to carry the kids into high school is the ability to communicate much more than, you know, whether they're a little better at soccer or a little better at chess. So, so you mentioned that you have a high percentage of, of girls participating in, in the program. Um, and we've noted as in the chess and education committee that lots of girls are playing chess at the, at the very younger ages, but the gap between the boys and the girls seems to grow as time goes on in terms of the number of participants. So have you noticed the same thing or uh, have you, um, can you talk about how you encourage female participation in, in your program? Well, you know, um, we have, for example, so we're taking a team of 11 to the K-8 Nationals and the majority of the people we're taking are girls. And most of the girls that we're taking are in, you know, sixth grade, eighth grade. Uh, fifth grade. So they're in sort of the upper grades when you would typically start losing uh, the kids. Um, so we're not seeing that as of yet, but I think what's also a benefit is that the things that Rice Scholars does, particularly like in the Summer Hawks program, that has a, a, an em a big emphasis on math and engineering and science. So they sort of like promote that continuation, uh, my opinion, uh, but then it also, pro it, it promotes uh, chess. Uh, so, but, you know, and probably Jay can speak more of that, but in terms of Hamilton, we're not seeing where maybe we have uh, girls participation, second, third, fourth, fifth, and then it starts like waning in sixth, seventh, eighth. I think any waning is done from both sides, boys and girls, a little bit, just by the nature of its middle school. But in terms of the chess participants, uh, we're seeing that same participation that was in fifth, go to sixth, go to seventh, and go to eighth. Uh, we have a core group of girls that are sixth graders right now that I'm, I'm really hoping they continue because like, it, it's fun to see them <laughs> competitive and, and playing all the time. Uh, a, couple, a couple questions about um, coaching. Um, uh, do you train like other uh, students at some point to become coaches or, or parent members or um, you already you already were a, a chess professional coach or teacher before you joined Hamilton? What advice would you give to schools that don't have someone who's already a chess player? or knows how to play chess to run a club? Because it sounds like the entry point for the, the things you're doing is, you know, lots of teachers could potentially do what you're doing with just some, some guidance. Well, I, th I think Rice Scholars has the model down pat because uh, particularly in the Summerhawks program, they're having the, Hamil the Rice program graduates once they move on to high school have a lot of them come back for the summer to be volunteers in their summer Hawks program. So even when I participated in their summer program last year, I had a lot of volunteers and mentors that are, were high school students that were previous program chess program participants helping me in the chess class. So uh, I think RISE does a really good job of really connecting with the students uh, while they're here and then they keep tabs with them as they go on through high school. And then they come back and give back to Rise uh, through that. And now they're, they're even helping some of the kids uh, with the tools and resources to even get into college. I, one of the uh, previous chess students just got a full ride scholarship to university. 
Um, so th they're really keep the, the continuity of that relationship and that inspiration um, and that network of volunteers. So, um, so that exists. My goal is that the ones that leave the program at Hamilton after they're done with me, they start the, their own clubs uh, when they move on to high school. That would be like a fantastic thing. Um, so I, don't I, know. I would I would add to that that um, <clears throat> when we first started the program and none of us played chess, uh, we leaned pretty heavily on Elliot Neff from uh, Chess for Life out of Seattle. And he gave us the confidence and the tools to do very elementary chess teaching. He also ran a seminar with teachers in second grade to show them how they, they could use the, the beginnings of chess in, in some classroom sessions, you know, the board, the squares, diagonals, uh, you know, just very, very simple stuff where they could introduce the game of chess uh, as, as, a, as an example. Later on, and, and uh, Abel's correct, later on, we have a lot of kids who have played some chess. So during the summer program, they come back as aides and just about everybody on that campus knows how to play chess one way or another. That takes a little time. And, you know, that takes time to develop. Um, it's, it's amazing in my mind that we're talking about being there because in the beginning, no one played chess. Uh, but, but, you know, there's ways to get it started and then rely on your alums. Find a way to bring them back to your club. So Jay, there's a couple of questions about, about Rise Scholars. How, how do you raise money for the program? How, how have you been successful in, in building this program um, to support the school? Yeah, so financially, uh, we're lucky to have, um, I would say, a few key donors who can anchor our budget. Um, not, not even near half, but there's an amount of money we can rely on every year. We have some grants from the local foundations who recognize our work. That's not really a huge amount. And then every year we do a fundraiser and um, it turns out our 130 to 150 volunteers in our various programs are also our donors. And they bring their friends and buy tables and drink some wine and support our program. So it's, it's a pretty typical fundraising structure. Uh, and we've been lucky uh, and, and to be honest, it's a very compelling story. It's, it's easy to sell. Um, we never take it for granted, so we work hard at it, but we're pretty lucky to have the support we have. So there's a question from Frances, uh, I guess for, for Abel. Uh, she says that she's, you know, she has trouble getting her kids to focus for an hour in, in, a, in an after school program. <laughs> what, what sorts of things do you do to keep them focused for two hours? I, I think one of the important things in getting that going, and it was even a challenge for me, like coming in, it's like, all right, well, it started as an hour and a half. Okay. How am I going to get them engaged? Although I've already had these strategies before, but I would say the most important thing is having transitions. So for example, we'll start off a class and, and it'll change, but there's many transitions. So start off a class, maybe we'll go over a game. Uh, from one of the kids that they had in the last uh, in in the last class, so we'll go over that. All right, stop. All right, I have the pairings. We're going to pair you up. So you transition from that to them actually playing a game. So they play a game, notate it, um, and then if people finish early, like I'll actually have them work together to enter uh, their game into chess base, which is our database. So then they get the working together and putting the game in, you know, give them an activity, but then after they play their games, okay, stop. All right. You know, then maybe I'll put a puzzle, uh, that needs to be solved. Right. And then, so it's just having transitions. I, I think the the danger of any program is to do like one thing and try to do it over the course of an hour and a half at, at doesn't work and that wouldn't even work for me and you know and I'm an adult I, I just don't have that attention <laughs> so I like an hour and a half but I think when a coach does transitions of different things I mean even the transition could be all right let's take a break let's do blitz and bug, bug house 10-15 minutes even that's a transition it's, it's just having the mind focus on like a new challenge it could because it feels refreshing to them uh, and then before you know it the time just like flies by 
but preparation is important. You sort of have to know what you're going to do and have that goal because the worst thing for a chess coach is when you're not actually prepared and you're sort of like winging it, like the kids feel that and the, the hours like seem like days, I think when that's it, but as long as you're prepared and have, you, you, you know, that feeling like when you're, when we're starting out. Right. But like the Thursday puzzle solving competition, I remember I had a puzzle solving competition where it was a half hour. I give them a half hour. When the half hour was done, they refused to stop because they wanted more time. I said, all right, I, I'll give you another 10 minutes. 10 minutes was up. They were almost done. No, everyone, no, we don't want to stop. I said, okay. It, it went on for like a full hour. And like, that wasn't even my doing. Like they wanted to keep going. And then after that was done, all right, let's take a, you guys worked hard. Let's take a 10 minute break, kind of, you know, blitz bug house. But then after that was done, all right, we got our pairings. Let's go. Let's get game ready. And and then so then the mind transitioned to like a new activity. So the transitions are important. The transitions can be anything. They could the puzzle solving competition. It could be playing game. It could be analyzing. It could be, you know, another technique that we've used is uh, where I'll put a set position on the board and then create teams of three. And then from that set position, there'll be one board where they can analyze, but then they go make the move on the real board with a clock, right? So then it encourages the teamwork, they're analyzing and, you know, it's different activities, but as long as the transitions are there, it, it really, really helps uh, a, a teacher. Uh, uh, Abel, so there's a couple of questions about, about, um, about running the club. And um, I mean, I think you guys are very fortunate at Hamilton to have the, this found, the, the foundation behind your work. Uh, but lots of schools don't have that. Um, and, you know, there's one parent asking a question about, um, you know, that their club only meets one day a week. And so, you know, there's so many schools that could, that could have programs, chess programs that don't. For a school that doesn't have a foundation behind them, uh, how would you advise them to sort of get started? Well, I, I, I would really encourage um, an online component. I mean, we even do that with our kids because like we give everyone chess kid accounts and, and we've had um, online tournaments on chess kid. I think if you're going to do like one day a week, I think you could still develop as a club fine, but the online component will be like really necessary, like maybe schedule one online tournament or even like uh, one lesson like after school and just get people together. And even at the school, I think like if, if you meet once a week, like wherever it is that you meet, whether it be, you know, a classroom or somewhere, maybe you can start like developing where like that room represents also the chess club. And maybe you have something there chess related to signify that's chess club. Uh, because I think that really encourages the kids to know, hey, that's that's the place to go for chess. I know when I was in uh, middle school, the, the math teacher was sort of like the one running the chess club. And he, you know, he would hang a chess board on, on the door. And then on chess club, that's chess club. And then there would be something in the room that would signify chess. He'd always have a board out and, hey, this is the club. This is chess club, right? So, uh, but I think if you're going to meet one day a week, it's definitely not impossible to kind of still create like a, a community and culture of chess players. Uh, but I think the on online component would be really important because uh, that's really the only way to kind of keep the continuity going uh, outside of the of the school and being able to run an occasional tournament. But even that, that's another thing for, you know, how do we develop more tournament directors to like run programs like that? This is, this I, I would, uh, John, okay. John, I would add, I would add real briefly the, um, every one of our board members is a volunteer and we all are responsible for some aspect of Rise Scholars. Uh, and so my point would be this, find a person who wants to be responsible for chess. It's not really expensive until you start to travel and do that stuff, but you don't have to travel, uh, but have a volunteer who's animated around kids, who wants to be doing this work. Uh, and you can, one day a week, you can have a modest, but really important program. It's, it's all about finding a person who wants to, to be involved. Well said. 
we're near the end of our of our webinar, and I want to thank uh, both Abel and, and Jay uh, from from Hamilton. Uh, there's a link in the in the chat if you'd like to give some feedback about this webinar. Uh, the Justin Education Committee is working hard to provide more resources, guide people in terms of building programs. The good news is that US Chess, uh, we have the highest number of members that we've ever had, uh, but there's so much more work to be done. Um, so we hope you enjoyed this webinar. Our next one will be on April 30th, and it's going to be large or small. Your school chess program can be a successful and celebrate the players too. And we're gonna learn about some programs in Detroit and in Tennessee. So we're, we're crisscrossing the country, learning about the best programs with all different kinds of approaches to chess education. So we hope um, you've, you've enjoyed this webinar and being come, becoming part of the chess educator uh, community. Have a great night. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.